You could say I live in the middle of nowhere. Well, I, I prefer to call it the middle of the wilderness, though. After living alone out here long enough, I thought it would be familiar with the land out here, even more comfortable. But I never have gotten comfortable. Maybe, maybe used to this place, but never comfortable. Pretty sure I can hold my own out here for the time being. But even so, lots of weird shit happens out here. I had to finally have a way to tell strangers who probably won't judge me or call me crazy. Back to the topic at hand. Weird stuff. See, I'll start with the first odd experience I had here. When I first purchased this land, I was really excited. There was already a house on the property that was the perfect size for me. Not only that, but it seemed pretty new. The former owners didn't stay around very long. And yeah, red flags here and there, but how was I supposed to know how messed up this place was? Anyway... I moved in without any issue, and within a week, I'm out on some trail that was already there, looking for deer tracks and some other game trails, and I'm actually having a pretty relaxing time until I swear, I hear a baby say, Mama, in the most stereotypical voice I've ever heard off in the distance. And now, like I said, I'm here in the middle of nowhere, so there shouldn't be anyone for miles. I just shook it off as me hearing things. Twenty minutes later, I hear the same voice again, saying, Mama. Only this time, it's maybe forty yards away on the other side of some trees or brush. It didn't even sound like a real baby. It sounded like some disturbed dude. Of course, by this point, he's definitely on my property as well. So I start making my way through the undergrowth. Then, when I'm sure I'm about to hit where he and the brush clears out to a, a clearing, and I finally get a glimpse of the man. He was butt naked, halfway behind a tree, wanting a huge smile, while his eyes stayed kind of squinty. He was also pretty skinny, as I could see his ribs. Now, usually you hear people say that at this moment my blood ran cold, but honestly, mine didn't. I was looking at some butt naked crackhead trespassing on my property. He decided to let out another mama during silence while I was trying to figure out my next move, so I promptly responded with a hearty, What the actual fuck are you doing? That's when he decided my next move for me. He started running at me, and I might have run away if he hadn't been so scrawny, so when he reached me with that big smile and looked like he was about to grab me, I punched him in the throat. It was a good punch. I was proud of it, honestly. It would have kept any normal man on the ground for at least a minute. And I get the first hint that this wasn't a normal man. While I was standing there, proud of my Mike Tyson level haymaker, the guy immediately got back to his feet, and before I had time to hit him again, he dive tackled me to the ground, and it, it hurt pretty bad. He somehow pinned my shoulders to the ground, and no matter how hard I kicked and punched him, he wouldn't let up, so I was forced to use plan B. I pulled out my trusty Bear Grylls survival knife, stabbed him in the gut twice. Now this finally got his attention. He hopped back to his feet, slinging blood all over me in the process. I got back to my feet, knife in hand, and waited for him to do something else. All he did, though, was stick a finger in his wound and lick the blood off. Then cartwheel into the woods, crying like an actual newborn baby this time. Now, by this point, I was pretty on edge. And right as he got far enough away that I could no longer hear him, I turned and I walked home. I know I should have run, but running through the woods is a so tiring, I just I just didn't feel like it. When I got home, all was normal again, at least for a while. Another story that comes to mind when I, I think about odd things happening around this area is the event that led me to no longer camp in my woods. By the time that the event in this story took place, I had already experienced quite a few things uh, on this property, and this was easily the third freakiest thing to happen up to this point right behind the naked stab victim that cried like a newborn baby and cartwheeled into the woods. This time I had decided that I wanted to go camping. And despite all the stuff that had happened, I'd never been seriously injured in those woods, so why not go sleep in them? Right? Bad choice, I know. But anyway, the first few hours while I got into the woods were fine. I set up camp, built a fire, Burned myself trying to cook a hot dog, piss on the fire that burnt me. And then I started to realize that camping is pretty boring when you're alone. So I decided to go to sleep. Next thing I know, I wake up to the sound of a young girl's voice down in the creek. 
Sounds like she's college type age. She's saying, help, I need some help down here. I'm lost, dad, help. Again, I can hear her down in the creek from my tent. Now, this isn't the first time that I've been lured into the woods by a voice pleading for help, but this voice was a lot more convincing than the others. Nonetheless, I still brought my newly purchased handgun that I had bought for dealing with the things on the land. Well, I made my way to the creek, flashlight in hand, and headed down to the voice. Soon I find the source. I didn't put the flashlight beam on her right away because I didn't want to blind her, but I could clearly see the outline of a small girl sitting on the bank of the creek. I got about 15 feet away and she stopped me, stating that you really don't need that flashlight with the moon out like this. It wasn't even close to a full moon, so that confused me a little. I replied with, I don't know about you, but I can't see a thing out here. Let me help you though, you hurt? Then I started to shine the flashlight on her, but she screamed STOP before I could get to her face. This time her voice wasn't convincing, and I could tell she wasn't human. What you guys need to realize is that I'm not a badass. I'm not trying to sound cool or tough, but ever since something happened three years ago, the same event that caused me to move out here, I don't respond to situations the same anymore. Maybe I'm not... Maybe I'm not scared of death anymore, and maybe I'm, I'm not mentally stable. Um, but maybe I'm weird. <laughs> but we, when I established that this thing wasn't human, I, I started to smile. It fooled me. It got, it got me into the woods in its domain and was probably going to make an attempt at my life, but I might as well piss it off a little, so I flicked my flashlight up and I revealed its face. It actually was a girl. Sort of. She was super pale and had abnormally large eyes. They were completely black when the light hit her face. Her head snapped forward and made eye contact with me and her jaw dropped open three times longer than any human could have. And she screamed it was loud, like, a, like an inhuman loud. It sounded like a, a girl's scream, but as if, as if it was being played through massive speakers to make it ear splitting. And then I felt something closing around my neck. She, hasn't, she hadn't moved, but something was somehow choking me. She's still screaming. I've realized while living here that the, the entities that can hurt you can also get hurt themselves. Now, most of them are tough as nails, but they can be hurt. This memory went through my head just as I felt something warm dripping onto my neck and my left ear went quiet, a busted eardrum, I guess. I aggressively threw my flashlight at the bitch and it connected with what I assume was her eye. I couldn't tell for sure because I didn't have a flashlight and yes, I forgot to use the gun. It was, it was new, and the, the current life or death situation, I forgot that I had it. Well, luckily, the girl wasn't one of the tough ones, and I, I felt the grip on my neck loosen, and her scream stopped, and no sooner had I taken my first breath when she bent over backwards, possession style, and started sprinting into the woods in reverse. When I finally caught my breath, I slowly walked up to my campsite, and I went to sleep in the tent. They may be asking why I didn't go home after that, but it felt like a 20 minute hike. My flashlight was broken, so I had to wait till morning. I slept pretty good though. No noises woke me up. I woke up the next morning expecting my ear to be killing me, but miraculously it was completely back to normal. I later figured out that it was the lady in the tree who fixed my ear, but that's a story for another time. This morning, I just packed up everything and I headed back home. The only thing that got messed up was my flashlight, so I wasn't even that disappointed in the trip. I didn't camp out there anymore because no matter how weirdly wired I am, that girl really did freak me out a good bit. And I'm sure she's still out there. And what you'll notice so far is that these entities aren't really very effective killers, but um, that didn't go for everything out here. I understand that skinwalkers are a common topic um, in the horror scene at the moment, and from what I can tell, I think that's the creature I'm dealing with, but I, and I could be wrong, because this is, if this is a skinwalker, it's advanced to another level. Not only does it imitate voice, it imitates appearance. It, it really wants me dead or gone. See, I like to call it skinny. Um, I think I, I pissed him off, though. And, when I say his name, I say it loud because, especially at night, I know he's listening. I've lived here for three years now, and he's been harassing me for about a year, and he's good. 
one of the smartest things to come after me so far. The, the only one that can seem to almost get in my head. He tries to lure me out, not by pretending to be someone in trouble like the other imitators that I've dealt with before. He's aware that that stuff doesn't work on me anymore. No, he tries to piss me off. He wants me to try to kill him. Problem is, we both know I probably can't. One time he did get me, though. I was watching a documentary about veteran suicide. I mean, it's a terrible topic. I'm a supporter of the armed forces. You know, I think it's terrible our government doesn't take better care of its vets that risk everything overseas so we don't have to. And they're doing a slideshow of men who had unfortunately lost the struggle with their own demons. And I, I, I had to look away for a second because this one guy that appeared on the screen looked too young and happy to have gone to this dark of a place. He was mixed race from what I could tell, athletic looking, had a, had a big dimple smile on his face. I looked away, I'm suddenly staring at the same kid outside my window. Same smile, same build, same uniform. One difference across his forehead was the word failure. I instantly knew it was skinny. He wasn't trying to imitate this kid, he was insulting him, and he finally struck a nerve. I had seen him imitate so many other people and try so many other tactics, but this one, this was the one that finally broke me. I was ending this creep. I exploded out of my chair, bolted from my bedroom, grabbed my 45, and proceeded to walk towards the same window the young soldier was still staring through. I got within five feet and saw that the word has changed. It spelled out, I deserved it. And after reading this, I didn't hesitate to raise my gun and fire two shots. But I think he ducked them. Bastard's fast. I stormed outside to try to find him, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. That's when I hear, Gotcha. Whispered into my ear, and I was flung across the wall of my house. The gun flew out of my hand in the process, broke two ribs, and dislocated my right shoulder. I was a dead man, and he knew it. Ever since the incident that led me to buy a house by myself out in the middle of the woods, I, I don't think I've ever felt fear again. Something's wrong in my head, but I did feel defeat, and I, I fell for his trap, and now he's going to kill me, and these thoughts passed in my brain, I passed out from the pain and the concussion, probably, and then, then for some reason, one that I don't understand, I woke up, it was bright outside, and I was covered in blood and in more pain than I'd ever been in my entire life, but I was alive, why was I alive? I struggled to stand up with my right arm hanging loosely at my side, and I I soon noticed the words carved into the outside wall of my house. Next time. Ever since I got back from the hospital, I told the doctors I'd, I'd fell off a roof. I've been trying to find ways to deal with or kill a skinwalker. Now there is a way, or if he's even a skinwalker, he beat me. I'm usually pretty lighthearted with most of these experiences, no matter how intense they are, but I just... I just can't with this one, because if... I lose to Skinny again, I guess I'll be signing off for good. Be careful out there. Don't be fooled like me. There isn't always a next time. And hey, I'm not dead yet, so maybe there will be a next time. I plan on telling more of my experiences in the future, so keep your eyes peeled for them. Until next time, this is Cole, signing off. My Property Isn't Normal, Part 2, by Murderbird17. Find more from Murderbird, check the links in the description down below. <laughs> I'm happy to see that my experience from Part 1 got some attention. Wasn't expecting this stuff to actually get any traction, see, I'm mainly here to vent and uh, have a place to catalog the stuff that's been happening around my house. People also seem to enjoy the part where the naked dude attacked me, then cartwheeled into the woods crying like a baby when I stabbed him. I'm not sure if he was human. Now I feel obligated to tell more of my experiences. Also, feel free to leave any questions that you have and I'll try to answer them in the next post. With that being said, if you haven't heard part one, I suggest you go back and uh, give it a listen. I'm going to tell the following experiences as if you've already heard the other experiences. This place is not normal, after all. 
and it does take some getting used to. Well, now the intro's out of the way, I think we can start with camo, and camo's a fucking nuisance. The first time that I came into contact with him was during the first white-tailed deer season that I had on my property. Now, I'm a hunter, but the program that is, quote, helping me after the incident said I wasn't allowed to have guns because the noise draws too much attention. It's bullshit. I live in the middle of nowhere, and there isn't anybody else for miles, unless you count the chosen, but I'm pretty sure the program is worried about them. Luckily, the lady in the tree hooked me up with this 45 caliber I now have in my possession, but I didn't have it upon first meeting Camo, unfortunately. Anyway, back to the story. I first saw him when I was walking towards a ladder stand that I had set up in a tree to watch deer. Seems like I couldn't kill them. And yeah, I could have a bow, but, but I, I'm, I'm shit with a bow. I'd risk just hurting the animal. I don't, I don't like the idea of an animal that's suffering because I couldn't make a shot that would kill it instantly. But now as I approach my stand, I notice a figure already sitting in it. It's about the size of a regular human. He was dressed in full camouflage. Pants, jacket, boots, um, hat, face mask, and uh, backpack. He actually seemed like a regular person, which I, I hadn't seen any of those in the woods for the entirety of the four months that I'd been living there. The things that live on this property are generally more extreme, but no matter how relieved I was to see a proper human for once, he was, he was deep in my property and hunting in my stand. I had to get him to leave. I reluctantly shouted over to him, Hey, you ain't supposed to be here. Time to go, dude. I was about 75 yards away. And to his left. But I yelled plenty loud for him to be able to hear me clearly. He didn't flinch. He just stays facing straight forward like a statue. What a prick. Look, try to be creepy all you want, but ignoring someone like that is just rude. I know he hears me. I have reason to believe that he's trying to freak me out because I made him break character before. So... After I yell and he ignores me, I start getting impatient. I yell the same thing at him again a little louder and still ended up with the same response. What a dick. So now I'm livid because he's making me ruin all my chances for seeing deer this afternoon by making me yell at him. So naturally, I start a brisk stroll over to tell him off to his face or maybe kick his ass. And I already noticed that he didn't have a rifle. So I just assumed that he was watching like I was planning to do. Of course, he could have had a concealed handgun, but I'm, I'm, I'm a dumbass, so I didn't consider that. Then I hear the crunch of something under my foot, and the sudden sound of rope sliding across the surface at high speed. I froze for a fraction of a second before I could, I could squeak out an, oh shit, I'm hanging upside down from my ankle. There was a loop around my leg that held me suspended seven feet off the ground like a damn cartoon. I was, I was like a fucking Looney Tunes character. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. I immediately knew it was camo, and when I look up, or, or down, shit, I was upside down, so I, I don't really know where I had to look, but I saw him slowly climbing down the ladder, like, really slowly. What a dramatic guy. If he wasn't so obsessed with appearances, he probably could have killed me. That's what I think he wanted to do anyway. There was a machete on his hip that I could see now, and the blade was, it was chipped in all the different ways to make it look like it was serrated. Wouldn't have been a very useful tool unless you wanted to use it to inflict pain. I think the biggest flaw with Camo's trap, though, was that he didn't account for the single fact that 99% of people who live alone in the woods learn to carry a large knife at all times. And that's a necessary thing if you want to stay alive. I wish I could tell you that I did a flip after I cut myself down and landed on my feet like some sort of badass, but I didn't. I landed on the back of my neck, and my vision went dark for about 15 seconds, which I guess was enough time for Tweedle Dumbass to finally get to the bottom of his ladder, and as I stood up, I saw that he was standing completely still at the base of the stand, still 50 yards away from me, staring at me. I could hear his thoughts from here. Damn, why did I get out? Damn, why did he get out? Shit, shit, shit. Then he turned, and he bolted. This guy was booking. I lost sight of him less than 30 seconds into my chase, and I, I had to give up. I needed to jog more. And what's more, by the time I got back to the ladder stand, it was already getting dark. I didn't even get to watch my deer. I've seen Camo on multiple other occasions as well, but I figured him out. See, he, he 
He got me the first time, but his traps really aren't that sneaky. They're elaborate, but not sneaky. He always appears in an area that I plan on hunting in. I don't know how he knows where I'm going to be, but I stopped questioning stuff on this land a long time ago, and I already noticed him long before I get to that location. Again, I have no idea how he plans his shit out. And secondly, there is always a trap set somewhere directly between where I first spot him and his actual location. If I had to draw a line from him to where I see him from, the trap will always be on that line. Also, another important thing to realize is that none of his traps are fatal. They're all meant to keep me from escaping, not kill me. They do hurt, though. One time I almost stepped on a bear trap that he had set out, and for sure that would have broken my leg had it gotten me. This non-fatal part was his downfall. I figured out that he didn't want me to die in a trap. He probably wanted to do the deed himself, or maybe do something else, but he really didn't want me dead in a trap. So all I had to do to get him riled up was die in a trap, right? After the lady in the tree hooked me up with a pistol over a year and a half ago, one of the first problems I wanted to solve with it was the creator of the various nets, ankle snares, and holes that attempted to contain me every time before. And I knew exactly how I was going to do it. One of Camo's recurring traps was just a large, 11 foot deep hole covered by a large amount of suspiciously patterned sticks and leaves that could literally have been seen 100 yards away. I just had to wait until he used this trap again. And after a swinging log that I think was supposed to knock me out, another net that was meant to land on top of me, I might add that it was made of wire so that I couldn't cut through it, but it also had a glare from the sunlight that made it impossible not to see. I finally came across the trap that I was looking for. Four weeks after I got the gun, I find myself walking towards an 11 foot hole, trying to pretend I don't see it. And suddenly, I start falling. I was ready for the fall, and I let out a loud yell as I traveled downward. And as I hit the ground, I stayed as quiet as possible, which was hard considering the broken toe and dislocated knee I had just received. Fuck Camo for making me do this. Well, I army crawled over to the other side of the hole. I laid my head against the side to make it look like I had broken my neck. Then I waited. It took 15 minutes for that little prick to dramatically make his way over to me, but I heard him walk up to the edge of the hole I obviously had to close my eyes to appear dead because I couldn't run the risk of blinking, but I almost smiled when I heard Camo muttering to himself, Oh shit, no, 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 they aren't going to be, they are going to be so fucking pissed. I took advantage of this moment and quickly opened my eyes and whipped out the pistol, firing three shots at him as quickly as I could. I missed all but one. The bullet that met its mark put a hole in Camo's shoulder and he let out a garbled scream of nonsense and gibberish, something along the lines of, You piece of fucking, you can't believe that ass fucking, you shit! He did end up running away. But as he ran, I heard him say, Fuck this dude, I'm, ah shit, I'm fucking done! I was laughing my ass off. Till I realized that I was severely injured and I had to climb out of this hole. Good thing it was daytime though, or I might not have noticed the black rope. Camo had lowered into the hole while he was cursing himself for killing me. I somehow managed to pop my knee back in joint, based on shit that I had seen earlier in life, and climbed out and limped my way back to the house. And that was a good day. Broken toes are fucking expensive to get treated though, and the best part is that I haven't seen Camo since that day. It actually worked. Wish I could pull something like that off with Skinny. Another thing I guess I need to explain to all of you readers is the lady in the tree. I've mentioned her a few times now, and at least some of you are probably wondering about her. Really, I don't honestly know much about her myself, but she's hands down the best thing on this property. My first experience with her was when she healed a broken eardrum that I had suffered when meeting what I assume was that banshee down to the creek. It was busted, and she screeched real loud, and when I went to sleep, I woke up perfectly fine the next day. I almost thought that it was all a dream until I saw the blood still on my pillow and the broken flashlight that I'd used in personal defense. Well, I guess this was the first time that she affected me directly, but not the first time that she'd helped me out. The true first time I didn't realize was her until, well, actually last night. It was the gun. The gun that I talked about purchasing at one point wasn't really purchased. I just wasn't willing to admit that I looted it off an old corpse that I found in an abandoned log cabin in the back of the property. 
This is an example of how sneaky she is. See, I only started to wonder if it was her doing while I was recording the first set of these stories. And I started thinking about how good a shape this gun was in. Of course, it was a little dirty when I found it, but it was also in perfect operating condition. And I figured, I figured the skeleton that was clutching it probably didn't need it anymore. But hell, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if it came to life each night. Either way, I left the cabin with a new sidearm and two boxes of ammunition. I didn't really think about it much because finding a gun on a body is pretty mild considering the events that go down here on a week-to-week -week basis, but yesterday I started questioning the real origins of this gun. It was so well-maintained. New feeling when I got it, but the skeleton looked like it had been there forever. Not to mention the fact that the gun was unloaded and the boxes of ammo were unopened. But the skeleton looked like it had died holding the gun, like he was intending to use it. it didn't add up. So I headed back to the cabin and I found my answer. Everything was the same. Same as when I got there. As it had been over a year ago. I mean, nothing had changed, especially not the body. The exact same as before. I was nervous at first, not because the body scared me, but because the joke about the skeleton coming back to life from earlier wasn't really that far-fetched in this place. I'd never seen an undead skeleton, but I... I've seen other forms of undead. Maybe I'll tell you all about those experiences some other time. Nervous or not, though, I had... I had to confirm my suspicions. I approached the body and I started examining the clothes. Just like I expected, the flannel shirt and brown jacket had no tags. Not like they had been ripped out, but... Like they were never there to begin with. And there was only one more thing to check. I took my knife and I scraped the blade down the skeleton's exposed arm bone. And sure enough, a shaving fell off of it. It was wood. The entire skeleton was made of wood and painted a light brown amongst other discolorations to look like the real deal. The lady in the tree is very talented when it comes to wood, but she could do so much more. I've only seen her in person two times. Once when I caught a glimpse of her smiling as she walked into an opening into a tree, only to close the opening with a door that fit so perfectly I couldn't see the edges when I walked up to it. And I just... It just looked like a normal tree. And a second time, two days after I encountered the screeching banshee in the creek, I saw her out the window of my front door, smiling in. She winked at me and ducked out of view. I ran to the door to try to see her fully, but by the time I... Swung the door open, she was gone in the night. Nowhere to be seen, which is really annoying. I, I would almost consider us friends by now. She still wouldn't show herself to me fully. Now when I saw her for the second time, I didn't know what or who she was. But when I looked at the ground and defeat, I noticed a small sheet of what looked like to be homemade paper. And on it was a short message that read, I wish to congratulate you on killing the keelet. He was bringing an evil over the land that was distressing the forest. I don't know how you actually ended him, but I am happy all the same. I have seen you roaming, and I am certain you have seen me. We work towards the same goal. Cleansing this land. My vows as a medicine woman keep me from directly interfering with the creatures of this land, but I wish you luck on your mission and will support you from the shadows as best I can. I hope your ears feel better. So I think the keylet she was talking about, me killing, I think was that, that rabid coyote that I had killed a few days before the creek incident. It was, it was honestly, it was hairless and just staring at me through some trees. And I think it was trying to intimidate me to leave its territory, so, so I shot it between the eyes and I left. My territory, bitch. But this was the first time I realized that I had someone on my side in this land, and that was a relief. She was actually really helpful. Once I got bit by a rattlesnake. When I got home, there was a bottle labeled anti-venom sitting on my kitchen table. Another time I got bit by one of those, uh, the shadow children while I was hiking. And when I got home, there was a bottle of, of purple liquid in a glass in the same place on the table. And I honestly expected it to heal the wound or something, but it just made me really drunk. <laughs> I guess she couldn't um, help me much that time. She's done other stuff too, but now I'm kind of worried about her. See, I haven't heard or experienced any, any help from her in eight months. I'm worried something got to her. 
or even worse. But she's mad at me. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, Skinny almost killed me six months ago, right? She didn't do shit. I've I've really grown to like her and even depend on her a bit, but she's just gone. I think I'm going to call it quits for this post, but hopefully I can stay alive long enough to do more. The hunt for Skinny continues, and if you don't know who that is, then shame on you for not hearing the first post before now. And if you do know who that is, I appreciate any suggestions you have for killing him. See you next time. This is Cole. Signing off. Tonight's story, My Property Isn't Normal, is written by Murderbird17. To find more from Murderbird17, check out his Reddit, linked in the description down below. Hey guys, I'm back. I know it's been a few days since my last post. One of the pails chewed through the wires of my generator, and since civilians aren't allowed out here by the organization, I had to wait three days for one of their electricians to get out here. The only reason I knew it was a pail that chewed through the main cable was because I watched it do it. I was hoping it would electrocute itself, but I forgot the part where that's the only source of power for my house since the Chosen has stolen my backup. This is probably a good time to say that if you haven't heard the first two installments of this series, you should, because I highly doubt any of this will make any sense. They aren't long, and I'll make sure they're linked here at the bottom of the post. Back to the regularly scheduled program, I realized while I was stuck in the dark for the past three days, reading books, hiking out of pure boredom, that I hadn't told y'all about the pails yet. And they suck, but they, they're kind of funny once you figure them out. I've seen them on quite a few occasions on the property. The pails are white humanoids that crawl on the ground on all fours, usually dragging their belly and using the same motion that Spider-Man uses to climb the wall. They can move at about a jogging pace, and their faces are usually stuck in distorted expressions of pain or anger. And boy, are they stupid as all hell. L let me tell you about the first time I saw one. I had already been living here about seven months, I think, so I was becoming familiar with the weird shit that calls this place home. I was out hiking some of the trails, kind of halfway looking for weird shit, halfway minding my own business, and suddenly I can hear what sounds like a baseball player sliding through the leaves of the forest, trying to reach home plate ahead of me. Only the sliding didn't stop. It was, it was coming straight towards me. I prepare myself by taking out my trusty Bear Grylls survival knife and entering what I could describe as an aggressive stance. But pretty badass, not gonna lie. And expecting some creature to come barreling out of the bushes in front of me, I was a little shocked to see a butt-naked man with super pale skin dragging itself from under the brush on its stomach. What is it with fucking naked dudes on my land, right? And I get one pretty woman at least. But anyway, after I got done being flabbergasted and became aware of my surroundings again, I became aware that the dude was almost on me and was reaching out for my leg. So I jumped on his back and it worked like a fucking charm. This little bastard didn't have human strength like some, some of the other things out here. So when I landed on its back, it couldn't do anything but sit there and flop its legs and arms around like a fish. At this point, I'm on the verge of tears. It hears me laughing and tries to turn its head and spit on me, which I, I mean, can't do. And that made me actually start crying laughing, and I fell off this thing at this point, and the creature quickly turned around and locked its teeth onto the toe of my left boot. I like to wear steel-toed boots around the property because even though they are heavy, I know that in a scuffle, being able to kick with a boot and not, not having to worry about breaking a toe is nice. This is what led me to realize that even though the creature didn't have super strength, it did have a super bite force. Now, when it first latched onto my boot, I wasn't worried, and I started trying to shake the thing off without much urgency. I already knew that it wasn't a man by this point, because it, it didn't possess an asshole or, or other genitalia. But I got a little worried when I noticed the end of my boot changing shape as the steel in the end started to bend. I then said out loud, if you don't stop right now, I'm going to stab your head, you little shit. It paused as if debating on the decision, and then slowly started biting down again while its eyes looked up at me, as if to try to call my bluff. I 
wasn't bluffing. A few seconds later, the thing is frantically clawing its way back into the forest with my favorite Bear grill survival knife, TM, still in the back of its stupid fucking head. Nobody likes a thief. Got back home fine, but I had to replace my favorite knife and get a new pair of boots. So, it's a pretty shitty hike. It was the next time I saw one, was when I figured out their biggest fear, and it's so stupid. I was down in my creek playing with a new toy that I had gotten in town earlier that week. It was, um, it was this net that was designed to catch little minnows, and <laughs> shit, it was a blast. I didn't really have any use for minnows or whatever other little fish that I was catching because I can't go into the only pond on the property that has big fish in it since I made that deal with a crocodile man, so I'm just catching them and letting them go. And I am suddenly greeted by the somewhat familiar sound of a grown man sliding across the ground on their belly. Now, it had been almost two months since the last incident that I had with a pail, but I immediately recognized the sound. This was the dunce that had stolen my knife. And I really valued that Bear Grylls knife, one that could be purchased at your local Walmart. I mean, it's a really good product. Unfortunately, the pail that emerged this time wasn't the same one. It had a different face and was more of a light pink than the original white that was on the first pail. It was still the same type of creature though, this time things went down differently. As it tore into the clearing that I was in about 30 feet from me, it froze, with its eyes wide. As it had tore through the brush, I was almost facing its direction, holding the net spread out to my side in the same way a bullfighter holds a red cape. I was preparing to throw the net into the creek. Pale's eyes were switching between looking at the net and looking at me. So I looked at the net and back at him. Then it clicked. <laughs> no way, I giggled to myself as I started to catch on to what was happening. I took advantage of my suspicions and started running and flaring the net around at the pail and it freaked the fuck out. It actually rolled over trying to turn too fast as it spun around and took off into the woods. I then started wheeze laughing as I fell onto the ground with tears running down my face. This fucking thing can bite through steel, but, but it's terrified of a nylon net. I know that might not be a funny story to some because I have a, oh, I have a twisted sense of humor, but oh, it made my week. Long story short, I keep the little net in my hiking bag every time I go out now, and every pail I come across is utterly mind-fucked at the sight of it. <sighs> oh, it's good times, man. Oh, I wish all the things around here were that easy to deal with. You know? On another note, I got an email from an organization asking me about the keylet that the lady in the tree claimed that I killed in the last post. I wanted to know if I had disposed of the body, and if they could come and retrieve the remains from the woods, if I had, you know, just left it. Then they said something that caught me off guard. When I said something about having to check with the program, the one that put me out here, they responded with, we are the parent organization of that program, and they proceeded to give me my own address, as well as details about my former life, um, that the only, only the program should have known about. And in all seriousness, I, you know, I have a dark past, and I haven't always been, I haven't always been a great man. But I'm done with that shit, and it pissed me off, you know, that they would ever bring it up. I responded with a simple fine, but don't bring that shit up again, and I blocked the emailer. No one's showing up yet, but I guess we'll see what happens, right? On a good note... I haven't seen Skinny in a couple of weeks, so that's nice. And, um, yeah. I'll see you all next time, and feel free to leave your questions in the comments, and if you have any ideas what these pails actually are, or what a keylet is, then please tell me. If any of you are good with research stuff, I'd appreciate it. I'll talk to you all again soon.
Well, I'm back, guys. Welcome to part four of this... Uh... Documentary? Catalog? Uh... Diary? I honestly don't know what this is anymore because I thought that I would... Only be using this platform to tell stories of stuff that happened to me in the past on this property. But now I'm being forced to bring this... The... Journal? To the present. You see, those people from the organization did come to see about the keylet. And now there's a guy named Mark living in my house, sleeping on my couch. Uh, well, not, not really sleeping, more unconscious. But we'll get to that part later. After a few days of this organization that wouldn't tell me their name, not showing up, I figured it was just a troll who managed to figure out my email account and hack into my personal life. Alas, on the third day, he rose. <laughs> Not really, no, but uh, four guys did end up knocking on my front door. They were all dressed pretty normally except for the matching grey combat boots that told me that these were men of action, which also means they're going to try their hardest to push me around and play badass. My suspicions were confirmed when the guy in the lead introduced himself as Mark and immediately asked me why I claimed to have actually killed Aquila. What a prick, right? Look, I still don't know what the fuck Aquila is, I don't claim to have killed one. The lady in the tree said I killed one. I only assume that she's talking about the hairless coyote that I killed down near the creek. At the mention of the lady in the tree, they all looked at each other with an expression of, this dude is a waste of time. Well, the feeling was mutual. I was getting a little impatient by now, so I chimed in with a, if you guys are done being superior to me, can I take you to where I killed the coyote? The one behind Mark, whose name... I don't remember, he said, sure, let's get this over with. So 30 minutes later, we're standing in front of where I killed the thing that I now know wasn't a coyote. Look, I know I know, I may not have clarified it yet, but I killed this thing well over a year ago. Shit, maybe two years. And the only reason that the organization knew that I had killed it was because of the post that I made earlier this week. A lot of decomposing and feeding can happen to a body in the woods over that long of a time. On top of that, I hadn't been to this part of the property in a very long time because... There aren't any trails or interesting locations here, but I was taken aback when I saw what happened to the body over the course of the two years that it had been out there. Absolutely nothing. The body looked like I had shot it yesterday. Only evidence that it was older was the fact that all the blood had all seeped out of the head wound and long since dried up. But the skin, the face, the fur on its paws, they were completely preserved. It only had fur on its paws, which was odd. When we got to the body, the snickering crew of four went dead silent. Now you said you killed this around two years ago, didn't you? Said Mark. Yeah, uh, but I hadn't been down here since. Why is the thing still preserved like that? What the hell's happening? One of the guys who hadn't said a word up until this point chimed in. Keyluts are so unusual. Dark that nothing usually in nature will have anything to do with an authentic one. Uh, this includes bacteria, fungi... Scavenger animals. Then he muttered something about a level 107 beast. Mark looked at me with a serious face and said, So this Keyleth story's true. Does that mean all the shit you said in those posts about this place were true? Before I could answer with a what do you think, asshole, a low raspy laughter started to surround us and begin closing in. It was coming from all directions. We looked up from the body to see at least... 50 hooded figures surrounding us laughing maniacally. All four of the military men pulled their concealed pistols and took aim. But before they could fire a shot, I called out over the laughter. Hector, I told you next time you and your little chosen crew sneak up on me, I'm kicking your ass again. Everybody paused. The chosen, the four organized men, and the pale that had just crested a hill 30 yards behind one of the cult members. A few seconds later, one of the hooded figures took off his hood and revealed a chubby, jolly-looking face with rosy cheeks and wire-rimmed prescription glasses. Aw, oh, man, we didn't know they were with you, Cole. We thought these were trespassers. We're sorry. Hector said with a downcast gaze. Why would you even need them to begin with? I retorted. Hector hesitated for a moment and said, Our God wants your real sacrifice. Those white, crawly, humanoid things just aren't doing it for him anymore. At this point, the pail that I could see frozen on top of the hill turned and bolted back in the woods. Hector then proceeded to call to the other hooded figures. 
They're with Cole. We can't have them. There was a collective sigh as the Chosen looked at the ground and walked away into the woods. I didn't notice until they were all gone that the four organization men hadn't lowered their weapons the entire time. Are you pussies ready to head back to the house? It's dark in 45 minutes. If those guys got you on edge, you won't last long at night. Mark shot me a look that explained in detail how much he hated me, without the need for words, while his three partners put their thick rubber gloves on and put the keylet into a sort of body bag. As we were walking back towards my house with the three stooges carrying the corpse of the demon dog, Mark starts questioning me. What was that group back there? Uh, some cult, I guess. They told me they worship, uh, cunt Hulu or something. He seemed kind of taken aback for a second and then asked, Why did they seem wary of you, but not flinch when we had guns trained on them? Um, simple. They don't fear death. But they do crack when exposed to severe pain for long enough. Again, Mark seemed surprised by my answer. He started to strike me as simple-minded. So... How did you inflict this pain on him? Look, I don't want to answer any more questions. I really don't. And I really didn't. This was the kind of shit that I don't like to dwell on. That was a different life. I don't like when it seeps back into the present. Sure, it's nice to have the local murder cult leave you alone, but... I used methods that I regret. To get that luxury. The last thing Mark said to me on our hike back to the house was, Look, dude. My mind is telling me that you're batshit crazy. My instincts are telling me that you're a threat. Which one are you? I looked him dead in the eyes and mumbled. That's up to you. And let me tell you, that look on his face was priceless. I love mind games. A few minutes later, we reached the house, and all four of the goons walked up to the big black van that they arrived in. They started loading up the body as I reached my doorknob to get inside. I hear Mark start raising his voice while talking on his phone. What? This guy isn't right in the head. I know there's stuff here, but why? Look, let me get a team down. Okay, yeah, he does have experience, but... Wait, what, what did you say? He then stared at me with a mixture of confusion and disbelief. They told him where I came from. I could tell by the way he looked at me. He hung up the phone without any more arguing and began to walk over to me. As he reaches me, he says, My higher-ups have told me I need to stay with you for a while and keep an eye on the activity around here. I responded with, You can't be serious. Wish I wasn't. They also wanted me to remind you that you didn't pay for this house or this property. And with that, I opened the door with my best butler impression and gestured for him to enter my home. As he walked through the door and dropped what I assumed to be his emergency bug-out bag on the floor, he froze. Oh, can I just say one thing real quick? Fuck Skinny. I didn't hear how heavily he was breathing at first because the van was making noise as it was driving away, but as those sounds faded, I realized that Mark was breathing like he had just sprinted a marathon. His eyes were trained on the window with his body completely rigid, with his hand on his hip, ready to draw his gun. I followed his gaze to the window where I had confronted Skinny many times before, and sure enough, there he was. Only this time, he wasn't somebody I recognized. This time, he was a fairly attractive, tall, athletic, blonde woman. She was smiling, holding a heart-shaped balloon. Upon closer inspection, I could tell the balloon read, It's a girl. I rushed in front of Mark to try to snap him out of whatever trance he was in, but I soon realized that tears were welling up in his eyes. By this, I gathered that this woman is no longer with us. And the girl most likely wasn't either. <sighs> Fuck you, Skinny. I calmly started explaining what Skinny was to Mark, but soon after I started, he stopped me. I read the story, school. I know that you've talked about this thing before. I'm trained to handle these kinds of things. So don't worry about me, because I'm gonna fucking kill it! 
With that, he made a mad dash to the back door in an effort to get outside and confront Skinny. I managed to block him and push him to the ground, saying, he won't come inside, so just keep your shit together and we live. Mark wasn't in a listening mood, though. He jumped back to his feet and straight into a fighting stance. Oh, great. After a second, he threw a fast left hook straight from my face. It wasn't fast enough. I ducked under it, and I swung and connected my elbow to the side of his chin. He went out like a light. And by the time the scuffle was over, Skinny was gone. He put Mark on the couch, and now I'm typing this. Thinking about going through his computer before he wakes up. Anyway, that's all for today. Please, if anyone knows what a keylet is, let me know. What did I kill? And what did Mark mean by he was trained to deal with this kind of stuff? What is he, a monster hunter or something? I'll try to get some answers before my next post. See y'all soon. I usually try to do some kind of intro to these posts, but today, I'm too excited to try to do that. If you haven't read my previous posts, you should, though. They're quite a bit more action-packed and explain all the events that lead up to where I am now. If you haven't read them, you won't have any idea what I'm talking about. Y'all remember the last post where I joked about Mark being some kind of monster hunter or something? Well, I went through his computer and I'll be damned if he isn't. He's got files on files, of even more files, of all these different tangibles, which I think means monsters. I even managed to find a file on the keylet. I wonder they didn't believe I'd killed one. Apparently a keylet is a creature in Native American mythology that's described as a furless dog-like thing. It does have fur on its paws though which supposedly makes it impossible to hear or track in the wild. Pretty tame so far, right? Don't worry, it gets better. Apparently, looking at them is supposed to immediately fry your brain and disorient you, <laughs> making you easy to kill for the creature. But that didn't happen to me. Only reason I can think of for the mind cooker effect not happening to me is because I didn't process things the same anymore. Not after the events that led me to live out here. Or maybe it wasn't even a keelan. <laughs> I mean, there was a few more details I didn't get to read because before I could finish, I felt cold steel on my neck. Mark had woken up and was now pressing a knife to my throat. What do you think you're doing with my computer? The fuck does it look like? I'm trying to figure out who the man that was passed out on my couch is. Mark thought for a second, still not moving the knife from my neck, then asked, Why? No, how did you knock me out? I know you have a dodgy history, but CQC fighting is my specialty. But all I can remember is going to hit you, and then it went dark. Careful not to move and slit my throat, I said, You got desperate? I went for a one-hit knockout. But frankly, your left hook is slow to hit your opponent when you clearly telegraphed exactly what you were planning on doing with your hips. I uh, dropped under the blow and threw an elbow to the bottom of your jaw. The knife loosened a little. You seem to know your stuff. Well, I pretend to be a dumbass, then. Um... Excuse me? First of all, I'm not pretending to be anything. Second of all, fuck you. The knife fell away completely now. I took the opportunity to turn and start asking my own questions. So, you are an actual fucking monster hunter, huh? He paused for a moment before replying. Yeah, I guess I am. So why is an organization that employs monster hunters also the owner of the organization that is helping me escape my past? Mark winced this time. Not a good sign. Cole. The organization that's claiming to help you escape your past probably doesn't exist. My organization has many false companies that it uses to gather intelligence and run experiments. I have reason to believe they put you out here knowing about your past in an effort to see if anyone could survive in an area that's known for having extremely high levels of tangible activity. They also knew that if you were to die, they wouldn't have to worry about people looking for you. However, I also think that you have probably far surpassed their expectations. The higher-ups haven't actually told me so, but they can't possibly expect anyone to kill a keylet on their own, or have fun with the creature like a flesh gate. Holy shit. Now that was a lot to take in. I took a deep breath, then cautiously asked, What the fuck is a flesh gate? Mark put both of his hands on his head and let out an, Ugh, serious dude. 
Does anything even phase you? Flesh gates are those things that you call pales. They're only level fours, but still too much for most people to handle, let alone fuck with on any regular basis, like you claim to do. There goes that fucking level thing again. I had seen various levels ranging from twos and threes all the way up to hundreds on the reports that I read while browsing Mark's computer, but I had no clue what they meant. So what's all this level shit about? All the monsters on your computer have one, but I don't know what that means. Mark shot me an angry look. Guess he was still mad that I had gone through his shit. We based beast strengths on how many unarmed adult men we predict it could take down before being overwhelmed. One man equals one level. Just then, I remembered that the level beside the keylet was 107. Wait, uh, uh, hold, uh, hold up. So you're telling me that the keylet I killed was rated at... Before I could finish, he interrupted me. One hundred and fucking seven. No way. I know about the mind-baking stuff, but that thing was no larger than a golden retriever. No way in hell it could kill 107 people. Your people predict that that dog thing could kill 107 people. No, dumbass. They predict it could kill 106, then lose at the 107th. I had trouble believing him. Look, Mark, I read about how they can cook your brain whenever you look at them, but I stared at the thing in the eyes. It had no effect on me at all. Why? This puzzled him. I don't really know. That's why I didn't believe it when I first heard that some dude claimed to have shot a Keelan. On Reddit. What really confused me is why the higher-ups decided it was worth getting a team to go investigate. Now I know that they were fully aware of the caliber of shit that happens here. Speaking of caliber... Can I see the gun that you used on the keylet? Ah, damn it. I knew this was going to happen. As soon as I mentioned the gun in my post, the organization had a no-gun rule for me, which is why it was a pretty big deal that the lady in the tree had helped me get my hands on one. But now, they knew. They weren't going to let me keep it. Now, fuck off, dude. I'm keeping the gun whether your bosses want me to or not. To my surprise, Mark looked genuinely confused by my sudden response. I don't want to take your fucking gun, I just want to see it. A normal pistol shouldn't be able to kill a keelet with one shot, no matter how perfect the aim is. I need to see what makes that gun so different and bring the bullets too. They're what I'm really interested in. He really didn't know about the rule I had been given about no guns. Weird. I reluctantly went into my room and retrieved my trusty 45 caliber thunder stick and the only box of ammo I had left. I started off with two large boxes of bullets, but... Over time, my supply was whittled down to just half a box. As soon as I dropped the weapon and ammo onto the coffee table, Mark immediately started inspecting one of my bullets. Knew it. Do you even know what these are, Cole? Uh, 45 caliber? I responded somewhat slowly. Without looking away from the bullet, Mark began to explain. These are gnat rounds, specially designed to deal with an unholy creature of chaos. They're created when the metals used to make the bullets are blessed by a Native American shaman and medicine men. You can tell what they are by the slight warmth they give off and the small vibrations you can feel when you squeeze them between your fingers. However, these are the most active rounds I've ever come in contact with. They're much warmer, vibrate much more than any rounds that I'm used to. If the lady in the tree gave you these, she's likely more powerful than you realize. Mark looked up. Maybe expected some type of awe at this revelation. Well, that's neat. I responded, somewhat dumbfounded. I guess it was cool to have enchanted bullets and all, but I didn't... But it didn't change much in the grand scheme of things. Kind of like how your car speedometer goes up to 120 miles per hour. Most people wouldn't even drive that fast, but it's cool to know that when the time comes, you might be able to. Then again, I guess the magic bullets came in handy when I shot the keylet, as well as a few other things. But maybe I should be more grateful. Before Mark could scold me again for the lack of reaction to his astounding observation, we were interrupted by a knocking on the door. We looked over to see one of the three guys Mark had worked with when he first arrived. Through the window of my door, we could see him frantically beating on the wood, looking over his shoulder. Mark! Mark had attacked the van! Holy shit, Jack! Jack is dead and Phillips hurt bad! Come help, Come help me carry him, please! Mark started to jump up, then caught himself. 
Cole. This thing's good. It almost got me a second time. Shit. It almost got me with a fucking help me technique as well. I started to smile. At least Mark wasn't a complete dumbass. I watched Skinny as he began that stupid grin he always did when he got figured out. Then he darted off. Not much has happened over the past few days. I'm starting to get used to my new roommate. I'll still keep y'all posted, though. Something wild is bound to happen sooner or later. Especially with the patrols. Mark keeps making us go on. It's Cole. Signing off. For now. In the last post I said something wild was bound to happen sooner or later, and I wasn't disappointed. Mark's been living here for about a week now, and he finally got what he was looking for. Action! It wasn't really in his favor, though. I mentioned the patrols he keeps taking me on last post, but I didn't really go into detail. He calls them patrols, but it's honestly more of a scavenger hunt. He even gave me a damn list, like a little kid or something. On the list were specific signs and objects that are indicative of tangible activity. Tangible is a fancy talk for monsters. Now I asked him what an intangible was as a joke, and he nonchalantly said ghosts and other shit that you can't touch. After I realized that he was serious, I popped the question. Why not just say monsters and ghosts and shit? He thought for a moment. Because the people who name this stuff are nerds. That's fair enough, I guess. I'm off on a tangent again. Back to the scavenger hunt. The list he gave me had a lot of stuff on it, and I was walking through the woods for the second time that day. One thing on the list kept catching my eye. Stairs. But what the fuck would stairs even be on the list? <laughs> That's not paranormal at all. Also, if there had been stairs in these woods, I would have already found them. That's not something you miss. I mean, I thought this whole search around for stuff idea was stupid from the beginning anyway, and I never searched for the, the hell spawn on this property. It always found me by itself. The only reason I even participated in Mark's patrols were to humor him so he wouldn't be as crabby. Big, and because I like to get outside anyway. Even so, stairs? I was looking at the list, eyeing down the word stairs for the millionth time, when it suddenly got dark. Now confused, I look up to see that it hadn't actually gotten dark. I was just in a shadow. A shadow that was cast by a tall, skinny wooden wall. I had been in this exact spot a few days earlier, and there had been no such object. The wall was about five feet wide, ten feet tall, and I somehow almost walked directly into it without realizing. I began to walk around it and quickly realized it wasn't a wall. Yeah, you probably already guessed. It was the back of a fucking flight of stairs. I was honestly fucking shook. It was like I had summoned them after thinking about them too much, and I immediately called Mark on the radio that he'd given me for situations like this, and yelled, Dude! I actually found stairs, like real friggin' stairs out here! I hadn't been this excited about something in a long time, and I had no idea why I was excited now. I think it had something to do with the thinking the stairs were such a stupid thing to look for, only to end up finding some when I never expected to. Either way, I barely heard Mark respond with, Okay, just stay put for a minute. I'll be there soon. And please, stop screaming. You're scaring away all the... the things out here. He said something else, but I wasn't listening. I was far too engrossed in these stairs. I had to go up them. It wasn't like they were calling to me or anything. It was more like the fact that I was... Pretty sure that I would be able to see my house from the top, so with Mark still saying unintangible commands on the radio, I began to ascend. As I walked up the stairs, the woods around me started to quiet down, which is weird in retrospect, but I really didn't pay any attention to that. Another thing I noticed was that there wasn't, there wasn't any leaves or dirt or anything on the steps. Anyone who had experience in the woods knows that it only takes a few hours for Mother Nature to spread her shit all over any given object that's left in her care. The real anomaly happened when I hit the top step, though. You see, the second my heel hit the top step, I heard Mark let out a, WHAT IN THE SON OF A BITCH! 
I froze. I started weighing my options. See, if I, if I let whatever was out there kill Mark, I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. I also told myself that I wasn't going to kill people anymore. Does it really count as killing him if I just let him die, though? And they'll probably just replace him anyway. I guess I'll go help. And with that thought, I went to go help him. I honestly expected there to be a pail clamped onto his foot, or for him to have fallen into one of those camo traps, but alas, all I found was Mark, without shoes on, just socks, clenching the toes of each of his feet in his hands. Before I could even ask him what was going on, he started, y y You went on the damn stairs, d didn't you? Yeah? And why does that matter? I'm telling you, if looks could castrate, Bad shit happens when you go up the stairs, you dick. I told you over the radio not to go up them. Ah, uh, must have missed that part. What happened to you anyway? Okay, now this part is kind of nasty. Mark let go of one of the ends of his socks to reveal that the toe area was covered in blood. He then removed the sock, and I shit you not, all of his toenails were gone. Damn! How'd you manage that? Are you daft, Cole? You did this when you went up those stairs. Yeah, it sounds stupid, I know, but I kind of believe him, because I know for a fact those stairs weren't normal. I'm kind of certain of this, because when I went back to where they were to show Mark, who was limping something awful, they weren't there anymore. Just disappeared. Mark wasn't surprised by this either, and in case you were wondering, I could not see my house from the top, which was a bummer. And that's about it for the stairs, but something else did happen yesterday. The day after the stair incident, I actually met a brand new monster. At least, new to me anyway. I think Mark knew what it was, but he wouldn't tell me. I gave him the spooks, though. As you may have already gathered, it happened on one of Mark's patrols. He was actually adjusting to life without toenails pretty good. I'll give him that. The night before, he took a large amount of bandages and some rubbing alcohol from my bathroom. I guess he did a good job on himself because he was walking pretty close to normal now. Well, I did hear a lot of groaning and heavy breathing that night in my living room, and I was hoping it was him patching himself up and not him, you know, having fun on his laptop, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, we were walking through an area of the woods that stays somewhat dark during the day due to the dense tree covering blocking out most of the sun. Other than the lack of light, everything seems pretty docile. That was until Mark started complaining about a noise. Cole, you hear that? <sighs> I think it's like static or something. Uh, no, what? I, I didn't, I didn't hear it that Mark put his hand on my chest, stopping me mid-sentence. I looked over to him to see what's up, and he's staring at me with extremely wide eyes. We need to get to the house, now! I've never seen him get so flustered, so I knew things were serious. I nodded and we both turned to run to the house, but the tall man was already blocking the way. When I say tall man, I meant really, really tall man. I'm also fairly certain that he wasn't a man. Tall man just makes up for a good name. He was between 10 and 12 feet tall and was wearing clothes made out of what looked to be like a dirty brown and tan rags that were stitched together. The rags covered his whole body, including his hands, feet, and face. He was also thin. Something deep in my gut told me that he had some kind of unnatural strength. As his image sank into my brain, I heard Mark whisper, Holy shit, it's really one of them. Off to my left. There was complete silence for a while, I'm not actually sure how long. The only thing that I could hear was a, st a slight static buzzing sound. No one moved in the silence, not Mark, not me, not the pail that was about to bite into Mark's leg while he was distracted. Oh, wait. Holy shit! Mark, look out! Pail on your right! With surprising speed, Mark pulled his Glock out and fired two shots into the pail's head. It didn't move after that, but the pale man did. The sudden scuffle seemed to set the tall bastard into a rage, and the once subtle static sound grew into a roar. It was like no sound that I'd ever heard before, maybe something like the sound of metal being ground up by other metal. However, the sound was, was the least of our worries. It started sprinting at us. It was originally about 30 yards away, but it seemed to cover the distance in the blink of an eye. He was on us before we could react. He went for Mark first, reaching out for him with one of those long, skinny arms. His fingers seemed to stretch out just so they could reach all the way around Mark's torso. As Mark was lifted off the ground, kicking and yelling, he emptied the rest of his clip into the tall man's head. It did nothing. That's about the time when the big black tentacles ruptured out from the creature's back. Six new weapons now ripping holes into the rags. This thing must be terrible at making its own clothes. Like, how hard would it be to just make tentacle holes so you don't end up ripping your clothes? Anyhow, 
I really didn't want this big fella ripping up Marks, so I had to figure something out. Before it managed to obliterate old Marky, I drew my gun and emptied my own clip into the various parts of the monster in an effort to find a weak spot. No luck. In fact, the bullets bounced off him. One of them whizzed right past my ear. It was like under those rags he was made of steel, but I'm no quitter. See, I now had his attention, and I'm pretty sure Mark was going, you know, unconscious at this point because he couldn't breathe due to the thing's death grip. I drew my brand new Bear grill survival knife, and I lunged at him with all of my strength at its legs, but I, I didn't stab it. See, if bullets couldn't really make it through this thing's skin, my knife didn't really have a chance. But I had a plan. I got behind it, only to get snatched into the air by one of its tentacles. I was immediately faced to, uh, rags with this thing? Its tentacles were wrapped tightly around my stomach. It now had Mark and I both exactly where it wanted. I swear that I could I could hear a deep, demonic laughter within the still roaring static that filled my brain, but it stopped laughing when I started. I began scream laughing, not really sure why. Sometimes I think that I might actually be insane. The tall man cocked his head to the side as if to say, you do know you lost, right? The only thing I was able to say before the last of my air was squeezed out of my lungs was, I really hope this fucking works. And with that, I took the knife that was still in my hands and I sliced at the tentacle as hard as I could. My hope was that since the tentacle could move so fluidly, the skin would have had to be much softer and weaker, otherwise it would be stiff and not flexible. Oh, how right that theory was. I was met with a spray of hot black liquid and the static sound morphed into the sound of nails on a chalkboard. I fell like seven or eight feet to the ground and landed flat on my back. That shit hurt, but adrenaline is a hell of a chemical, so I was back on my feet almost instantly. Two things I noticed off the bat. It was holding a now unconscious mark, and my attack hadn't quite managed to slice through the entire tentacle, but I was close. The thing seemed to be deciding on whether or not to retreat, or to try to kill me again. I took advantage of his slight hesitation, and I leapt on the now limp tentacle. I grabbed it and yanked with all the force I could muster. Now, it completely severed itself from the beast. Suddenly... All the sounds in my head stopped, and I heard Mark hit the ground off to my right. I looked up only to see the tall man's covered head aimed at its now disconnected appendage. Then at me. Then at the woods behind me. Then at me. Then at his tentacle. Something tells me that he's never been injured before. And after he finished looking at stuff, he bolted backwards just as fast as he approached us. Yeah, he sprinted off. Yeah, backwards. What's with monsters and running backwards? Seems silly to me. And dangerous. Anyways, I ended up having to carry old Mark over my shoulder back to the house, and he could stand to lose a few pounds. He woke up a few hours later and interrogated me on how I managed to scare the thing off after he passed out. I told him I just ripped off my clothes and started running at the thing until it ran off. Mark said he won't let me see the thing's file until I tell him what really happened. But I really want to sell the naked story? Maybe I'll tell him what really happened later and let y'all know what the real name of the creature is, or maybe I'll just keep trying to convince Mark that while he's a monster hunter, I'm a monster predator. <laughs> That's it. But, uh, I'll post again soon, and in case you were wondering, I haven't seen Skinny in a few days. Still haven't heard from the lady in the tree in a while. But life goes on, right? Be sure to check out the other parts of the series. I'll have the link below. Until next time, this is Cole, signing off. So, Mike got possessed. Uh, it's a new experience for me, honestly. Um, also, I think that we're going to have to deal with Skinny soon. So he destroyed a van the other day that was carrying supplies out to us. And I'll get to that later on, though. I actually learned a lot from the spirit that possessed Mark before it left. Oh, uh, yes, it left. I didn't have to banish it or anything. Let me just tell you this story before I, whew, before I end up spoiling something. The day after the tall man incident, referring to part six, for more information on that, Mark started acting funny. Uh, but like, in a good way, in my opinion. He was much less commanding and hostile, like he had no energy. This meant that he didn't want to keep checking around the property for monsters constantly, and I was able to do what I wanted again without him complaining. Once I noticed the change in his behavior, I thought of two reasons that could be causing Mark to act this way. One, he was sick, 
Two, he was being a little scaredy prick after almost being killed by the tall man. Turns out, I was wrong on both accounts. See, after two days of Mark being reserved and borderline unresponsive on my couch, I knew something was up. As much as I don't want to admit it, Mark is a badass in his own right. He isn't the kind of person to crumble after a traumatic event. He's a fighter. I was aware of his unnaturally aggressive fight-over-flight response when he first encountered Skinny and almost rushed out to certain death just to show Skinny that he wasn't here to play games. And on top of that, he didn't show any real signs of sickness. He was tired and slow to respond, yeah, but he wasn't sensitive to light like a concussion. He wasn't hot or cold, no runny nose, no terrible breathing, etc. It was on the third day of this strange behavior, yesterday, when I confronted him and got an answer. So, uh, Mark, any idea why you're so tired and lazy and shit? And just as I finished asking this, Mark shot up in a sitting position on the couch and whipped his head around to face me. In a voice much higher than his regular voice, he exclaimed, I thought you would never ask. I finally finished taking over this body a few days ago and was waiting for the right moment to reveal myself. You see, Mark is on vacation right now, and I'm taking his place. Oh. Uh, nice. Uh... When will he be back? His white smile quickly found itself upside down. You know what, Cole? This is why I really hate you. You are literally no fun whatsoever. Well, I mean, if, if you aren't Mark, I don't know you. And how would you know that I'm no fun? Uh, don't you know it's wrong to judge a book by its cover? Mark's... No. The replacement Mark's voice was starting to sound irritated. I am a ghost, dipshit. I've been here for months trying to fuck with you. I even tried to possess you, but unfortunately for me, you are incompatible, and no matter how hard I try to get your attention or scare you, I was always met with you just brushing it off. I worked really, really hard, too. Like that time I moved the TV while you were watching, or the time I put holes in all your socks to make your big toe pop out. Oh, I was, I was finally starting to catch on to what was happening at this point. Oh, I thought the TV was just, uh, you no, know, the way- Holy shit, you're the one who put holes in my socks?! You piece of cock meat, you you made me think I was I had sandpaper toes. He chuckled a bit. At least that one worked. Anyway, as you probably already know, being a ghost has its limits. It's extremely difficult to have any effect on the physical world, and we can't affect living tissue in any kind of direct way whatsoever. So now that I have a vessel, I can finally kill you. Oh, well shit, that escalated quickly. As I process the new information I had just received, Fake Mark speaks up again. One thing I bet you didn't know is that as a ghost, when I take over a body, I can't see all the host's memories. But the body still retains any natural reflexes and skills that the host has acquired through his or her lifetime. And this guy has some seriously badass skills. Fake Mark then sprang to his feet and did a roundhouse kick that shattered a nearby lamp into a million pieces, then turned to my wall, punched as hard as he could. Pretty sure he expected to punch right through, but only ended up, like, leaving some bloody knuckle prints. Uh, yeah, that's, a. Uh... There, there's a stud there, I said as fake Mark doubled over, holding his damaged hand. I now realize that, thank you, he wheezed out before standing back up straight again. Even so, this guy is plenty skilled enough to end your sorry ass, fake Mark shouted with a wicked grin. Ah, uh, you must have been out the first night he got here, but okay. He cocked his head a little after this comment, then quickly brushed it off and lunged at me. Now I'll try to explain what happened next as best as I can. As he rushed me, he threw a right-handed jab at my head. I countered this by hooking my arm over the inside of his shoulder with my left arm as I ducked the punch, and put my right between his legs so that I could lift him off the ground, and then did a fireman throw, which basically means that I tossed him into the air and subsequently slammed him back onto the ground by exploding back up into a standing position and releasing my hold on his legs while still keeping a strong grip on his shoulder. This made fake Mark fly over my head and still slam into the ground at my feet. I wanted to explain how this happened so people don't just accuse me of bullshitting. And for the record, I don't think this would have worked on real Mark. I'm pretty sure that he would have seen it coming. Anyway. This should have knocked the breath out of him, so I wasn't ready when he punched the back of my knee and dead-legged me so perfectly I went straight to my ass. Middle school me would have taken notes on perfect execution of this move. Fake Mark ended up getting back up to his feet before me, unfortunately jumped onto me and pulled me flat on my back. Fake Mark then reeled his fist back for a final blow, and as his fist flew towards my face, I managed to move my head to the side at the last second, and his fist connected with the hardwood floor at a respectable speed. 
He may have been able to recover from this quickly if it hadn't been the same hand he'd already smashed into the wall a few moments before. As Fake Mark winced to the pain, I threw my leg into the air and proceeded to connect with his no-no square. It was more effective than the slam from earlier, that's for sure. I stood up slowly while Mark tried to decide if he should use his remaining good hand to grab his crotch or his shattered knuckles. Before he could decide, I grabbed his Glock that was sitting on the coffee table and took aim. It didn't take Fake Mark long to look up and realize that I now had complete control over the situation. He stood up, but he didn't make any further advances at me. He instead opted to put on a pouty face and plop down into the recliner in defeat. Then it hit me. Hey, why are you afraid of dying? This isn't even your body. You can't die again. Can you? Fake Mark snapped back into a still somewhat aggressive tone. If this body dies while I'm in it, I get sent back. I don't think I'll be able to escape again if that happens. Why are people always so vague when I ask any questions? Escape from where? What? what that, that's an important detail. I fully expected Fake Mark to snap back again, but all he did was look at me in the eyes and mumble, Hell. The absolute terror on his face seemed genuine. And usually I try to stay respectful and patient with someone in an emotional state like that. Unfortunately for Fake Mark, he wasn't a person, he was a ghost that was possessing my, uh, uh, acquaintance? And I didn't really appreciate that very much, so I continued with my questioning. How did you escape the hell for the first time? Fake Mark was surprisingly cooperative now. I found a gateway and walked through it, ended up in this land. I think there is some sort of portal to hell around here. It seems that most ancient creatures that come through instead of regular spirits. Only thing I can figure is that they were banished to hell only to be let back out into this location. Oh. Damn, I was expecting like a badass story about a battle with the devil, not an actual possible cause for all the crazy shit that's going on. Alright, um... Well, you seem to know your shit! Why do I get the idea that you know more about hell and monsters than the average lost soul? I was a preacher in life. But, what? Then why were you in hell? Because I studied the occult in my spare time and skimmed out of the donation bowl. Oh, uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, guess God is cheeky like that. But what makes you think that all the weirdos in those woods come from a portal to hell? Big Mark then started speaking in a more relaxed and confident manner. Not all beasts out there come from the portal. Actually, most of them don't. Just some of the particularly nasty ones. You met one the other day. I think you called him the tall man. He is a recent immigrant. I think he got banished in the 70s by some monster hunting group. He was one of the more average ones, but you already know the most powerful one, don't you? At this, fake Mark started grinning. He was right. He knew exactly who he was talking about. It's that Chuck Hulu guy! That the Chosen worship, isn't it? Fake Mark's grin transformed into a grimace. Holy hell, Cole, I seriously fucking despise you. It's that thing you call Skinny. Cthulhu was a cosmic entity from another plane of existence, separated from hell. Skinny, on the other hand, is absolutely a product of hell. Oh. So he's a demon, then? No, not a demon, but an amalgamation of at least a few other creatures that I'm pretty sure old Lucifer created himself. If I had to guess, Lucy's planning to take over the mortal plane and is throwing some creatures out here to test waters before his final assault. Shit. Well, that isn't good. I might be on his bad sense since I keep mooning Skinny. Also, did you know what Skinny is? No. But I do know that he doesn't seem to be able to enter a home without being invited in. And when he takes the appearance of something, whether it be a sumo wrestler or a baby rabbit, he maintains the same weight and strength as his regular form. Huh. And do you know how he stays the same weight? Because I once saw him spying on a squirrel, only to snap the giant branch that he was parched on under his weight, then proceed to shred the trunk of the tree with his tiny squirrel claws until it fell out of frustration. I remember that tree. I thought it had been attacked by a family of six-legged beavers. The ones that lived down by the creek, but I guess I was wrong. Alright, it's beginning to seem like Fake Mark was a serious asset when it came down to knowing about the stuff around here. Also, I'm curious about what different monsters make up Skinny. If any of you have any ideas, feel free to comment, because I'm pretty clueless as of right now. The invitation thing is from vampires though, isn't it? I don't know if that sounds too cliche to be true. Anyway, anything else you want to get off your chest, preacher man? I guess I hit a nerve with that question. Fuck you! I am a woman! I am tired of you being so damn clueless! What? I didn't know that women preachers were a thing! Again, poor choice of words, Cole. That's it, I'm leaving! They're practically screaming at each other at this point, which is, in hindsight, is really unnecessary. Okay, 
To be fair, you don't look or sound like a girl in Mark's body, and uh, all I ask is that you answer one more question. Fine. I had to be wondering about this since the beginning of the conversation, so I was ecstatic to get one more chance at it. You said I was incompatible for you to possess me. Why is that? At this, fake Mark took on a serious expression. It means you are either a descendant of some saint or some godly power favors you. Or maybe. No, that couldn't be. And with that, fake Mark seemed to pass out. Guess it was the spirit leaving his body. Soon after, real Mark started to wake up and ask where he was. I told him that it was a long story, but he should probably get some fresh air before I told him. When he grabbed my outstretched hand so that I could help him up, I squeezed. While he yelled in pain, I calmly told him, You owe me a new lamp. And that's all for Mark's possession. See, he actually took the news pretty well. I think he's been possessed before or something. I... I kept the part about me being incompatible to myself, not really sure why. It just didn't seem like something that I should share at the time. Things are heating up around here. Something big's gonna happen soon, and when the information that we got of the spirit preacher lady... It's starting to look like me and Mark can't do this on our own. I think he called in backup, but he won't actually tell me for sure. He just keeps looking out the window a lot. I'll update again soon. It's Cole. Signing off. Guys, I've got a good bit of explaining to do. I've lied to all of you on a few occasions now. I haven't... I haven't lied about the creatures, ghosts, or people, though, so don't worry about that, but I have lied about how I acquired some of my possessions. As you all should know by now, I didn't purchase my 45 caliber handgun. It was gifted to me, somewhat indirectly, by a good friend. What I have not explicitly stated yet was that I didn't exactly buy my house or property either. I'm sure many of you already figured that out, though. What I'm getting at is I was placed here. Three years ago, I was approached by an organization while I was hiding out in a bar in Mexico. I have no fucking idea how they found me because even though I had been shit-faced for about two solid weeks, I know for sure no one in the area spoke English, so I don't think they could have ratted me out or that I could have ratted myself out. I fucking tried to find someone, honestly. Also, the people I was hiding from are not paranormal in any way. And there's a story I'm not certain I want to share right now, but I'm going share also, the people I'm hiding from are not paranormal in any way. That's a story I'm not certain that I want to share right now, but I may share later on. Anyway, this group approached me and made me an offer. Again, I had been shit-faced for, like, two straight weeks, so my memory is a bit spotty. From what I can remember, though, they said something about helping me escape the problems I had created with... Uh, that group. Normally, I would have immediately suspected that they were the enemy in disguise, but again, drunk-ass me thought that this was the greatest fucking thing that could have ever happened. I mean, they were offering me a free place to stay, with a limited amount of monthly allowance to purchase food and whatever else I needed. I just assumed it was government funding. Then again, the government thinks I died 12-ish years ago, I think. None of that matters now, though. See, I pretty much figured out what really happened behind the scenes with some help from Mark. We've been sharing a hospital room for the last week, so we've had plenty of time to think. I'll get to how we got here soon. I think this is going to be a long post. So as much as Mark and I can figure, the organization that was offering me witness protection type services was actually a fake front that was run by the monster hunting group that Mark works for. Their goal was to find someone with above average survival skills to see how long a human could last in an area with a high concentration of fucked up things roaming around. Let me emphasize that the assholes that planned this experiment probably didn't expect me to survive my first encounter, let alone live there for three years. Then, when the keylet showed up, they got giddy. According to Mark, they'd never been able to observe a dead keylet before. Well, before the one that I killed. He sure knows how to make me feel special. And that's when Mark and his crew got sent out, and old Mark has been here with me ever since. I think that was four-ish weeks ago. But enough about the theory shit, let me tell you about the clusterfuck that put me and Mark in the hospital. That ghost preacher bitch that possessed Mark a while back only got about half of her facts right. I found this out when Mark and I decided to go to the home base of the local cult that lives in the back of my property. They call themselves The Chosen. 
I don't know what they were chosen for, but I know for sure that no one in that ragtag group of dipshits shouldn't be chosen for anything but extermination. They've tried to sacrifice me three different times now. The last attempt, they went as far as attempting to try and burn down my house, but I caught them in the act and convinced their leader, a short Latino man named Hector, to not bother me anymore. I really didn't want anything to do with them because they're... awkward. But Mark was certain that they probably had some information about why more deadly creatures seem to be popping up in a higher rate, or maybe at least have some knowledge about Skinny. I tried to convince him that I knew more than the Chosen when it came down to Skinny, but he insisted that I was about as observant as Helen Keller, whoever the fuck that is. So there we are, standing in front of their little shanty town they call, uh, the Ponderosa. It's mostly made up of metal sheds and parts of mobile home, yes, parts and people living inside with whole walls missing. Keep in mind that these people aren't poor. Almost all of the members have nice cars and trucks parked outside their homes. A new Chevy Silverado, nice Ford Mustang, many others that I don't know the names of off the top of my head. I don't really understand what philosophy leads them to living happily in a shithole like this. Each their own, I guess. We found Hector pretty quickly. He was in the middle of the squalor preaching about something or another. He noticed me and Mark almost immediately due to the fact that neither of us is wearing dark robes like the rest of the cultists. Mark was wearing black combat pants and a great long sleeve shirt that made him look like he meant business. I, on the other hand, was wearing blue jeans and a Twizzlers t-shirt. Hector began somewhat solemnly, I guess we have guests now, and proceeded to step down off of his upside down five gallon bucket. As he approached, Mark whispered just loud enough for me to hear, they're surrounding us. And sure enough, he was right. I look around to see not only Hector approaching us, but about 60 different cultists approaching from different directions. They were closing in, and both Mark and I prepared to draw our weapons to defend ourselves when Hector called out, Children! Calm down. Don't you see he's got a gun now? Let's please try not to get on his nerves now. I could see Mark start smirking out of the corner of his eye, but I didn't have the heart to tell him that they weren't talking about him. Look, Mr. Uh, Hector, right? You were just wondering if you had any idea about where some of the paranormal creatures in this area are coming from. The question seemed to make Hector uncomfortable. Uh, we haven't seen anything like that around here, so... Just then, one of the black-robed cultists came bursting through the surrounding crowd. Grand Bishop Hector! The baby doll spider came back! At this revelation, Hector knew that we knew that he knew what we wanted to know. All we could do was look back and forth from his distraught follower and us. He finally just decided to awkwardly smile at us. As much as Mark wanted to continue questioning, we both noticed that the cultist that came back was missing large chunks of his robe and, uh, his flesh. While the man stood there hyperventilating in front of his leader, Mark pointed something out to me. Cole, he's wearing a severed head, he whispered. We didn't want anyone to overhear us while well, all the focus was on Hector trying to console the hysterical man. I pointed to Mark's observation with, look, that thing is coming. You might have to put the skinny hunt on hold. As much as these people are a nuisance, I really don't want to see a community get slaughtered. Mark shot a confused look at me. I agree, but we aren't prepared to fight with something like that. While we were talking, I felt a tap on my shoulder. It was Sonia, uh, Hector's second in command. I hadn't seen her since the last time I was in their little neighborhood, and I hadn't really left on a good note. Now she looked deadly serious. Cole, we have all the information you want and some that you probably don't. But before I tell you, we need your help. This thing is going to tear us to shreds, but I have a way to get rid of it. Sonia was the only member of the Chosen that struck me as a somewhat smart person. I think she was raised into the cult, and that was the reason why she hadn't left. In some twisted way, it's her only family. Before Mark could protest, I answered. We're in. So what do we... I was interrupted before I could finish my sentence by a loud screeching. The sound was beyond unnatural. I could describe it as a young woman screaming in terror, but the tone kept changing instantly, like a shitty auto-tune from hell. Mark and I looked to each other. Fuck. Fuck indeed, Mark. Fuck indeed. I looked back to ask Sonia what she planned on doing, but when I looked in her direction, she was already sprinting off. I really hoped that she was grabbing some sort of secret weapon and not just being a coward. I didn't have time to dwell on these thoughts, though. There's the beast, cresting the hill. Mark said as he jerked my attention back to the situation at hand. Sure enough, 
As I looked through the trees that led upward, I could see a mass of tan, white, and dark red charging down the hill. As it charged closer, as the cultists started running around wildly, some pulling out their spears and knives, but they looked like they were trying to use chopsticks for the first time. They weren't going to be much help. I was starting to make out some details on the thing as it approached. The main defining feature of the uh, baby doll spider was that it was in fact made out of what looked to be uh, baby dolls. And not just dolls though, mannequins, uh, cosmetic, cosmetic practice heads. It seemed like all the different objects were held together by some magic stickiness. I disagree with calling it a spider too, it had four legs and two arms. It was shaped more like a centaur. Another odd detail was that each part of its body was made up of that specific body part. Where the head should be were a mass of mannequin doll and other forms of heads that were just crammed together. Same rule follows for legs and arms, torso, and so on. Mark, what the hell is that thing? I don't know. Usually if you see a doll or something moving around, that's a possession. That lady you were talking to better have a good idea. The abomination was now closing in and had reached one of the outermost sheds that dotted the Chosen's headquarters and began tearing it to pieces. I don't think guns are going to work on this thing. I bet it doesn't have internal organs that bullets could damage. And I doubt that it would respond to nat rounds since it doesn't look Native American. We're going to need to use stuff that'll break it. Mark said as he grabbed a spear from a nearby cultist and slung it at least 40 yards to hit the thing on the torso. Oh, what the fuck? Mark, I throw spears now? Even though it was a solid hit, the monster didn't reel back at all. It just looked in our direction and let out another screech before charging at us at full tilt. It was at this point that I realized that the beast was not colored red anywhere on its body. All of the deep red that I had seen was just blood that was caked onto the baby doll centaur. Oh, damn it! Doll spider does sound better. As I got closer, Mark yelled, Get its attention, I got an idea! I nodded and pulled out my 45 pistol, knowing that it wouldn't kill it, but it, it could at least distract it. I now realize that I'm actually starting to trust Mark with my life. Something I hadn't done in a long time. I started hitting center mass as the creature neared 10 yards from Mark. He now stopped and turned towards me. Mark took advantage of this brief pause and sprinted at the creature. I was confused by this. Until I saw the round thing in his hand, a grenade. I kept firing and Mark slid under the belly of the beast and plunged his hand in between the parts that made up the creature's torso, then continued his slide out from the other side. As he got back to his feet, he yelled, COVER! and dove behind a nearby Cadillac. All the creature had time to do was start looking over at Mark's direction before it was obliterated by a teeth-rattling explosion. <laughs> Hundreds of body parts rained down everywhere. That may have been the most badass thing I've ever seen. It really was. It's really a good thing that Mark still carried grenades with him everywhere since the tall man incident. Cheering began erupting from all around the compound, but the celebration was short-lived. As I jogged over to check on Mark, I noticed that the body parts were still moving. Not only that, but they were all moving towards the same central point. The yells of joy started dying down as more people began to realize that the thing was just putting itself back together. And just as Mark started to grab another grenade concealed somewhere on his body, I heard a familiar voice of Sonya screaming my name. Cole, take this! The woman that lived in the tree said that you would know what to do with it! With that, she tossed me what looked like an oversized minnow catching net. It didn't make sense. No way in hell that this thing would be afraid of a net. Like the pails were. Even if it was bigger. All my doubts melted away when I caught the net, though. Sonya was right. I knew exactly what to do. A wave of, uh, something came over me when my fingers made contact with the net. It was like an absolute certainty of something. But I wasn't sure of what exactly I was certain of. I looked down at the net and realized where the weights were on a normal minnow net. This one had medium-sized rocks. On these rocks were symbols or runes of some sort that I didn't recognize. They would have been hard to see on the rocks if they weren't glowing a bright blue color. Mark looked at me with a stare of confusion, then snapped back to reality and commanded, Get your ass in gear and use that thing! I bolted in the direction of the now half-formed doll spider, and I slung the net over the wriggling mass of body parts. Uh... No, nothing happened. The body parts kept moving in place, and the net didn't seem to phase the thing. Oh, shit. I could hear Mark say to himself from behind me. And then it hit me. It was like I remembered something that I had never learned before. Before I knew what I was doing, the word Rakulscha erupted, escaping my mouth. All at once, blue runes changed into a deep red, and smoke started rising from the net. The beast managed to get one more half of a screech in before it... Well... I guess it just 
kind of stopped existing. While the cheering started to erupt again amongst the cultists, I immediately approached Sonia. Something she had said when she first approached me was hanging heavily on my mind. So, do you mind explaining why you called her the lady who lived in the trees and not the lady who lives in the trees? I said, with more force than probably was necessary. Look, Cole, I know what you need to know. She came to me and she explained everything. Yeah, it's our fault that some of these beasts exist, but the shapeshifter needs to be dealt with now, and you're ready to take on that task. Hector doesn't even know. She was certain that you'd be able to fix this. Please, just listen. The somber tone of the young woman's voice told me that my suspicions were true. The lady in the trees hadn't been hiding, though avoiding me this whole time. And that was really hard to swallow. This was just the beginning of a path to a dark place that I hadn't visited in years. I just hope that, that Mark is willing to come with me. There's more to this story. This entry is getting long, so I'm going to cut it off here and post the rest of the story at a later date. Till then, this is Cole. Signing off. I just found out the one person on this godforsaken plot of land that I had considered to be on my side before Mark showed up is dead. That's right, folks. The lady in the tree wasn't mad at me. She wasn't ignoring me. She had been deceased for almost a year now. She's the one who really proved me a means of survival over the past three years. She gave me a gun with magic bullets. She gave me hearing in an ear that had been destroyed. She gave me antidotes alcohol. <laughs> I'm pretty sure she even did my laundry once. I also can't help but think that she had something to do with the fact that the spirit preacher couldn't possess me. The most important thing she gave me, though, was her trust. Based on the few times she had directly communicated with me through letters, she had always alluded to the fact that I was supposed to be the one to help cleanse this land of the supposed darkness. Like I was the chosen one or some shit. Whether I'm actually special or not, though, she trusted me absolutely and failed. In her mind, I was battling these monsters and scaring them away from here. I was the hero that she had been waiting on. She couldn't fight the creatures directly due to some sort of oath. In reality, all I've done for the past three years was dick around and get lucky. I've never gone out looking to solve the monster problems around here. Even when I set the trap for camo, that was purely selfish in reasoning. I just... I was just annoyed by his constant attempts at trapping me. I didn't do it for the greater good. Looking at my life, I've really never done much to serve anyone else but myself. Even... Even stuff I did after my dad was killed, I wasn't avenging him, I was getting revenge for me. I don't know why she ever decided that I was the one that would make things right. What instincts had told her that I was the man that could finally change something? I, I really wish she'd never decided on me in the first place, because that fact alone is why I typed this in my hospital bed. My throat is hurting, my lip is trembling. Actually, that might be the hospital food's fault. Not really sure at this point. Enough sad monologuing, though. Time to get back to what happened. Uh, Sonia had some explaining to do, and I fully expected to get every ounce of useful information from her. First question I needed answered was, what the hell happened to the lady in the tree? Sonia, what happened to her? She looked at the ground. It was obvious that she was dreading having to explain this to me. She snuck into what was left of my shelter in the middle of the night, after Skinny attacked the Ponderosa. She told me that this Mark, who seemed to materialize out of nowhere, cut her off. I understand you want to get right to the part where the tree lady died. But first, there's some other questions that need answering. Why did Skinny attack in the first place? Do you know where he came from? Do you know how to stop him? I turned to argue with Mark because I was the one he wanted to get to the part where she died, but unfortunately, Mark was right. Yeah. As much as I want to hear about what became of the lady in the tree, we need to start from the beginning. Now, what was that you were saying about some of these monsters popping up that was your fault? I guess Mark hadn't heard that part of the previous conversation because now he looked at me with surprise etched into his face. Sonia was even slower to answer this time. Well, um, Cole, it, 
It wasn't my fault per se. You know how stubborn and persistent Hector can be. I didn't really like where this was going, but I had a pretty good idea. Yeah, I mean, he tried to kill me. What, six times, I think? Without thinking, Sonya replied, nine. But that's not what's important. What's important is that Hector has been trying to summon Cthulhu for years now. But in the last year, he's finally started having progress, somewhat. Mark chimed in. What exactly does this progress consist of? The young cultist paused for a moment, deep in thought. Well, that attempts at summoning rituals started working, just not as we planned. Things were coming through the portals we created, and things weren't what we meant to summon, though. So far, we've summoned a 15-foot-tall cloaked tentacle man that has been kidnapping our brothers and sisters on a regular basis, until recently the baby doll monster that you both saw, and uh, the spirit that keeps creating minor inconveniences like broken plates and shoelaces being stolen from their respective shoes. But this last thing we summoned, by far the most vicious, was the shapeshifter. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So let me get this straight. You people are responsible for the tall man, the ghost preacher bitch, the baby doll abomination, and skinny. Was there even a point where you thought, damn, these rituals aren't really helping us out very much. Maybe we should stop. Sonya shrugged as she looked at me. This is Hector we're talking about. <sighs> well, she had a point. Hector didn't know when to quit. Mark decided to pipe up again. And what finally happened to convince you that these rituals were a bad idea? When the shapeshifter killed half of us and only stopped, after saying that he was going to take a nap and come back for the rest of us later. Yeah, well, that's pretty solid reasoning, I said after considering what she said. So, was it during Skinny's nap that the lady in the tree came to talk to you? I asked. Yeah. It was a few hours after the attack. The community was absolute chaos while Hector tried to calm everyone down. I was in my shed, trying to figure out what I absolutely needed to take with me. When I fled... And that's when I hear a woman whispering, hey, to me. It was her. I immediately knew she wasn't one of us because, well, she doesn't wear much in the way of clothes. And we're very strict about our dress code here. What did she want? This time, Sonya took a deep breath and closed her eyes before answering. She said that she had a way to save us from the shapeshifter. But she had a message and a few things that she needed to leave with me. After telling me this, she went back outside for a moment and when she came back, she was carrying three large nets. She explained that the nets were for the man who lived up on the hill, you, and that I was to give them to you as soon as possible. She also said that she thought of a way to keep the shapeshifter from attacking anyone again until you had a chance to deal with him. The revelation puzzled me. I knew for a fact that the lady in the tree couldn't directly attack or harm any creature as part of an oath. Mark stayed silent, deep in thought. I, on the other hand, kept on pressing Sonya for answers. So why the fuck didn't you tell me any of this sooner? This, this information would have been hang, oh, I don't know, like a year ago? Sonya flinched as I finished my sentence. Honestly, Cole, I was just scared that if you saw me, you'd want to kick the shit out of me. I guess I couldn't blame her for that one. I did, uh, kick the shit out of Hector. Right in front of her a couple years ago. Okay, okay, okay. Did she tell you how she planned on doing this? She never got the chance. Before she could explain any further, we heard screaming along with the sound of ripping metal outside. We rushed out to see a nine-foot-tall Ronald McDonald ripping someone in half while laughing like a madman. The Native American woman looked at me one last time and said, Make sure to tell Cole that he alone can send these beasts back using those nets. He may not know it yet, but he will know what to do when the time comes. The elder spirits will guide and protect him. With that, the Indian woman took off towards the shapeshifter, which was now a giant werewolf. As she got closer, she started screaming some words I didn't understand. She also started glowing blue, which was odd. She finally got to the shapeship. Just call him Skinny. It's catchier. Sonya seemed kind of annoyed that I interrupted her, but she continued all the same. She got Skinny's attention when she stopped five feet in front of him. She was lit up like a blue glow stick at that point. She had stopped chanting at this point and was just standing in front of Skinny, trying to catch her breath when Skinny said, well, aren't you different? I've never killed a glowing one before, and proceeded to casually swipe at her with a clawed hand. The Indian woman didn't even flinch. When the first claw made contact with her, there was a deafening boom, accompanied by an explosion of what looked to be a red mist. Well, Skinny can vaporize people? 
I blurted out, now a little more wary of my plans to attack Vanity. Sonia was quick to set me straight, though. No, 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 she did something to herself with those incantations. Before that point, all Skinny had done was shred people into smaller portions of people. Mark muttered in response. Probably some curse that she set on herself, as a trap so Skinny attacking her would trigger it. To bypass her rule of not being able to cause direct harm to any other creature, since in a way, Skinny cursed himself by attacking her of his own will. Did anything change about Skinny's behavior after Lady in the Trees? Mark slid his thumb across his throat in a slicing motion as he finished. He glanced over at me with what looked like pity in his eyes. Um, yeah, uh, what's your name? His look of pity quickly turned to a look of annoyance. Mark. The expert said with a growl. Yeah, Mark. His behavior did change. See, after the Indian woman disappeared, it only took a few seconds for Skinny to regain his composure. He almost immediately started laughing, then said, What the hell was that? A suicide bomber attempt? Pathetic. However, as he lunged to grab yet another person, one of my sisters, he fell to the ground in writhing agony. He got up and tried again and again, but each time he attempted to attack someone, he was met with paralyzing pain. So the curse makes it so the Skinny can't hurt anyone, I said, apprehensively. Because six months ago, Skinny smacked the dog shit out of me and I almost died. Not quite. See, the curse has one catch. We found that out when Martin, Cthulhu, bless his soul, tried to take advantage of his inability to attack and launched an assault of his own. But when the baseball bat made contact with the creature, he was immediately struck down by a clawed hand. He slapped the palm against my forehead. Ah. That makes sense, so we can only attack you if you attack first. That's why he tried to get us pissed at him. He made it seem like he was trying to lure us outside to disguise the fact that he was actually luring us into attacking him. Both Sonya and Mark looked at me, somewhat startled for a moment, before Mark spoke up. Cole, pardon me, but I'm honestly only used to you saying stupid shit. But I think you're actually right this time. I started to argue, but I quickly realized he was right. Yeah, fuck you, Mark. So do I kill or banish Skinny by tossing one of those nets on him and yelling whatever magic word comes into my head? Wait, how the actual fuck do I know what magic word to use? Sonya answered my question with, Yeah, I don't really understand that either. Let's just roll with it. Just then I heard Mark say, What the fuck? Behind me. This was odd since Mark had been standing in front of me for a few minutes now. I turned around and sure enough, there was a second Mark behind me. This meant that either Skinny just walked up pretending to be Mark... Or even worse, he had been talking to us the whole time, and now knew everything that we knew. Sonya and I both backed away from the marks as they stared at each other in confusion. And then back at me. The mark on the left yelled, Throw the net on it now! And now's your chance to end him! The other fired back, No! He's trying to trick you! Throw it on him! Fast! After a moment of thought, I said, Okay, so I think I have a way to figure this out. Whichever one of you is the real mark just has to punch the other Mark to prove that you can attack first. Both Marks shouted, But then he'll kill me! And this Sonya whispered in my ear, Damn, he's good. But I had already knew what my next move was. Sonya, give me one of those nets. Though, as she handed me one of the nets that was laying on the ground next to her, I started walking towards the Marks until I was right in front of them. A wicked grin spread across my face as I said, All right, here's a question only the real Mark would know the answer to. How did I get the tall man to run away? The mark on the left quickly responded, Uh, you cut off a tentacle. Couldn't Skinny have seen that? I now looked to the mark on the right to see how he planned to respond to the situation. All he did was squint his eyes and sigh. Then, in a defeated tone, he said, You took off your clothes and you ran at him naked until he fled. Satisfied by his answer, I slung the net over the top of the leftmost mark's head and yelled out the new magic word. Eklahachalrika. Not really sure why the magic words that came out of my mouth were different from the ones that came out when I got rid of the baby doll monster, but like Sonya said, I guess we could just roll with it. As the runes that were carved into the rock that outlined the net started to glow red, and Skinny was swallowed up by smoke, I heard him utter, No fucking way! In a deep voice. Then as the smoke that swallowed him was blown away by a breeze, he was gone. Pretty anticlimactic, right? I was honestly kind of hoping for some badass battle where we fought to the death and 
got to stab him with a magic wooden spear that was like a final gift from the lady in the tree or something while saying something cool. But in the end, Skinny was defeated by an immature inside joke. That's it. I mean, yeah, the tall man's still out there somewhere. Skinny's done, and the lady in the tree got her wish. That's really all I could hope to accomplish. Mark was pretty pissed off at me for putting him, like, on the line and risking sending him to another dimension on the basis of him remembering an inside joke. In response to his anger, I just told him that I had faith. And uh, in the end, that's all that mattered. All he said in return was, Fuck you, I need a beer. <laughs> I didn't tell him how I had really figured out who was the real one when they both said, But then he'll kill me, in unison. See, the new Mark that had just walked up shouldn't have known the real rules of the curse, since he hadn't been there to hear about them. All I can figure is that Skinny had probably been listening in, disguised as a cultist, and decided to end the conversation and stop us before we came up with a plan to kill him. I really just wanted Mark to believe that I was dumb enough to put his life on the line for something that Skinny could have easily heard It had been eavesdropping by at the right time. That serves him right for basically calling me a dumbass earlier. After Skinny was dealt with, Mark and I shared an uncomfortable couple of goodbyes with the cultists, most of whom hadn't even noticed what had happened, including Hector much less appreciated the fact that we just got rid of the single most vile creature that had ever inhabited this land, but I was okay with it. The fact that the lady in the tree's killer was gone for good was enough for me. And some of you are probably asking, wait, if that's all that happened, then why were they both in the hospital? Well, that actually happened when the headquarters of the monster hunting organization that Mark works for summoned both of us to be interrogated after the events that led to the destruction of Skinny and who they knew to be an extremely high-level threat. After all the paperwork and questioning was over with, Mark offered to take me out for a drink. I accepted, long story short, uh, don't drink and drive, kids. They even took up our electronics for the first week we were here. Claimed that it was so they could scan them, but I knew it was just punishment for damaging a company-armored SUV. Anyway, that's pretty much it for now. I'll try to keep posting, but now that Skinny's gone, the land seems a lot more... relaxed. I hope you all enjoyed the tale of how I finally killed Skinny. And this is Cole, signing off. Hey there kids, and happy October. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you a couple things that are happening this October that haven't ever happened before. First off, if you take a look at the channel, you'll notice that I'm currently live. That's right, we started up doing a Halloween horror radio program. That means 24-7 without interruption, you'll be hearing Creepypasta stories, read by yours truly. And as well as a few other guests that we've had on the channel before. The other thing are Halloween exclusive t-shirts. These t-shirts are available in the Mr. Creepypasta link down below in the description. Actually, at any point if you want to check out the description, feel free to scroll down and see what kind of cool stuff's going on down there. Oh, and of course, the Halloween countdown starts on the 18th. Look forward to seeing you all in sweet dreams. <laughs>